All right, now, we are here in Proverbs chapter number 1, and of course, the whole book of Proverbs is just a, a great book of, of wisdom and knowledge, and it's important. That's why the, the very first, you know, very the second verse says to know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. This is the point of the whole book of Proverbs. Um, lots of great truths. A lot of times, just one or two verses that just just hammer at one at at a, at a truth. Um, very um, applicable truths in our life as well. I mean, these are the proverbs are something that. I mean, this stuff never gets old. It doesn't require that much, you know, insight. They're just real on the surface. You get some great truths. Um, not that saying that it's not deep, because it is. But this is something that you don't have to look into very deep to get a, a very profound truth just right up on the surface. Um, but what I'm going to be preaching about this morning, and we're going to be spending a lot of time in Proverbs, is taking correction. This is something that, that I think every Christian probably struggles with to some degree. We need to learn and understand how to be able to take correction. Nobody, see, taking correction, nobody likes to be told that they're wrong about something. Nobody does. Especially, um, you know, and it may even be harder, like, the more you, you study and know the Bible, or maybe the older that you get, the more years and the more experience you have, Sometimes it might be harder to, to, to receive a correction on something because you feel like you, you know so much, you experience so much. And now taking correction, I, I want to make this clear, obviously you, you, <laughs> you've got to be wrong about something to, in order to receive correction. A lot of people are going to try to tell you that you're wrong about different things, and it doesn't mean you're always wrong. Okay, But we need to be able to identify when we are wrong, and how we deal with that and, and be able to receive that correction. Nobody, none of us should get to the point to where we think that we just know everything and that we are above reproach, we are above rebuke. You know, nobody can correct us because we just know everything. I mean, this is a problem that pastors can have. This is a problem that, that anybody can have. And we're going to go through a lot of scripture here just, just stating how important it is to be able to humble yourself to God's word and to God's truth. You might have some, a 10-year-old boy come to you and correct you on something out of the Bible, but if it's coming from God's word, we need to be able to receive that and not just blow it off. We, we always ought to have a heart that's ready and open to receive God's word. Even if we've had you know, previous thoughts in the past, or, or, you know, we've been taught wrong, or we've thought wrong, whatever it may be. But when we see that truth from God's Word, we need to be able to receive it. And like I said, not everyone likes taking correction. Now, oftentimes the way that correction is going to come, too, is going to come from the pulpit where we're preaching on sin, and you're going you're gonna to hear something and be like, typically the biggest problem people have with taking correction is because it may be something that they're doing. <laughs> Right? If you're not involved in something, maybe you've never learned it before and you hear it, but you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's easy to receive that. If, uh, for example, you know, there's a new, a new Christian here and they're not, they don't drink alcohol. They never have. Not a big deal for them. Then they hear it preached from the Bible and they say, oh, okay, yeah, well, the Bible says, they, you know, we shouldn't be getting drunk. We shouldn't be drinking alcohol. We shouldn't even be looking at it. It's something we should avoid. Not that hard for them to receive because there's not even anything that they're doing. It's a lot easier to hear that stuff and, and be like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, now I know that. As opposed to someone else who maybe every weekend they like going out and going out to the bar and having a drink. And then when that person hears that, you know, how are you going to respond to that? Are you going to be able to take correction and hear what's being preached and be able to apply it in your life? Or are you going to bristle and brush away and be like, no, that's not right. But let's look at some scriptures. I'm going to get. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. The the first, the most important thing to remember with taking correction, the number one thing is staying humble, not being lifted up with pride, not thinking that you know everything, being able to, at the very least, if someone comes to you to rebuke you or correct you, at the very least, listen to what they have to say before you just automatically shut them off, just, just hear it. And with humility, analyze it and, and, and you know, compare what they're saying with the Bible, with God's Word, 
if what they're saying is false, then you, you could say so. You don't need to be corrected if what they're saying isn't true. But if what they're saying is true, you know, you, you need to have that humble attitude. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read a couple of verses for you, but we're going to stay in Proverbs 1. Proverbs 22, 17 says, Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto knowledge. So he's saying to bow down your ear. Right there, when you're bowing down, that's already a sign of humility. He's saying, bow down your ear. Right? Hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto knowledge. Get your heart right. Get your head right. Bow your ear down. Say, you know, get your head up out of the clouds for me. Get your nose not lifted up so high. Bow your ear down and, and take a listen and apply your heart for knowledge. And then in Proverbs 15, 33, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. We need to have that humble spirit, a humble attitude. Keep that in mind because I'm not going to focus on that too much today, but that is, that is still one of the key elements for, this, for, for being able to receive correction. But we're in Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse number 20. Just to get the context of, of this passage here where we're reading here, the Bible says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. So this is talking about wisdom. right? This is, this is a, a colorful way of, of saying you know, wisdom's crying out, you know, her voice is in the street. She crieth in the place of concourse and the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her word, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Simple just means, you know, in a rude way of saying it, it's stupid, right? You're simple, you're stupid, you don't know very much, right? How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. This is, this is wisdom saying these things. Verse 23 says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So wisdom is saying, turn at my reproof. Reproof is being told that you're wrong. Your reproof is, is someone saying, hey, you're wrong about this. Wisdom is saying, turn you. Now, what's another word for turn? Repent. Right? When you repent, you're turning from something. You're, you know, you're, you're changing your mind or you're turning from an action. You're doing something. You're doing a, a, a turning. So basically what, what he's saying here, look, when you hear wisdom, you need to rep repent when you're reproved. You need to turn. You need to turn away from whatever it is that you're doing and receive that wisdom, receive that reproof. And what happens? The rest of that verse is, Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. But now look at what happens in verse 24. It says, Because I have called and ye refused. So this, these are people who don't want to hear that reproof. That they don't turn. They hear wisdom, but they, they reject it. Right? They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be corrected. They just want to keep doing what they're doing. Because I have called and ye refuse, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel. That means you made my, my advice is like nothing to you. And would none of my reproof, again, reproof is being told you're wrong. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. When God's telling you, you need to do something, you need to change. Hey, this is wisdom. You need to turn. You need to repent. You need to change your ways because this is the truth. And he says, you, when you don't want to receive that, when you want to turn away from that, he says, okay, when the hard times come on you because you're a fool, because you don't want to receive this correction, because I'm trying to help you. And that's what God's Word is trying to do. When we're preaching on sin, when we're doing any of the stuff written in the Bible, hey, it's here to help you. It's here to help make you better, to, to avoid the snares and the traps of sin that's only going to hurt, and hurt you in your life. God's trying to prevent you from going in that direction in the first place. But if you decide and say, you know what? Nope, I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to hear that. I want to do my own thing. He says, okay, I tried to tell you. I tried to warn you. But if you want to just keep going down that route, guess what's going to happen? When your calamity comes, he says, I'm going to laugh at you. People say, well, that's not very nice. This is, this is the Lord. This is God. This is His wisdom and His truth. 
this is an aspect of God that a lot of people don't understand. But it's the truth. And this is what we're reading in, in Proverbs chapter 1. He said, I'm going to laugh at you. When you're, when you're all of a sudden fearful and really scared because you've gotten yourself into this big mess and you don't know how to get out, hey, you didn't listen to me before. Now I'm going to laugh at you when that, when that hard time comes. He says, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distri distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me. And that's where people have this false idea. say, oh, well, God's always going to listen to you no matter what, all the time. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. I say, I'm not going to answer. You had your chance. I tried to tell you before. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find, find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. We need to make sure that we don't have this stiff neck of hearing God's word and hearing the reproof, hearing when we're wrong about something and just not wanting to hear it because if we just keep doing that, and, and God, and we get to this point to where we're in calamity now because we just didn't want to listen to God, we can't expect God to just save us out of that. We've made our own bed and we're going to have to lie in it. And that's, that's one of the consequences of being stiff-necked and not receiving correction. You can't just, just rely on God always, even when you turn your head at Him, even when you turn your back on Him, to, to just deliver you out of every single problem that you have in your life. Now, we know God can deliver, but if you're not willing to listen to Him, if you're not willing to receive that knowledge and take correction when you, when you're, when you need that reproof, then God's just going to let you go through what, whatever it is that you're going to end up going through because of it, as a result. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 9. We're going to spend a bunch of time in Proverbs this morning. Proverbs chapter number 9. The Bible says in verse number 7 of Proverbs 9, it says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. We ought to have an attitude where we actually want to be corrected. We ought to have the attitude, you know, like I said earlier, nobody really wants to, to be told that they're wrong, but that's in the flesh. No one really wants to hear that. But in the spirit, we should always want to be told when we're wrong. If you're doing something that's not right in God's eyes, wouldn't you want to know about it? Wouldn't you want to know that, hey, this thing that I'm doing in my life is wrong and God is not pleased with it. God is not happy with that. I would love it for someone to come up and just tell me, hey, look, you, you know, you're teaching this or, or you believe this or you're doing this in your life. That's not right. And this is why. And God, you know, God's word says thus and so. And I want to hear that because I don't want God upset with me. I don't want God angry with me. And God will be angry with me if I'm sinning against Him. If I'm not living the way that, that He wants me to, hey, I want to try to get that right. And that's the, the heart, the attitude that we need to have. Every time we come into church, every time you pick up your Bible, prepare your heart. Get your heart right about wanting to receive God's Word, even if it means you're wrong about something. In verse 8, it says, you know, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. If you're smart, if you're a wise man that gets rebuked, hey, you should love that person that, is re that brings that rebuke. You might say, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, if someone, you know, if someone comes to me and rebukes me, why should I love that person? Because they love you enough to tell you that you're doing something wrong. See, the person who doesn't love you is the one that's just going to talk to you about the weather and, and just think that everything's fine, even though they can see you've got a problem. But... Um, but they don't want to tell you about it because they're worried about hurting your feelings. Well, I'll tell you what, don't worry about hurting my feelings. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm in need of rebuke, rebuke me. Um, well, <laughs> the Bible does say, though, as far as, as far as a pastor goes, you know, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. Now, I'm not saying that I am above rebuke, but that's the, the way the Bible says you ought to, to, to approach the pastor of a church because the pastor is a teacher, 
and I've been ordained to be to be the pastor of this church and um, I do have a certain knowledge of the Bible in order to even become a pastor of the church so one of the reasons you know you ought to respect your pastors the elders and treat them with respect of, of humbly and treating them not just flat out rebuking them um, that's what you know that's what the Bible says but I still need to be told that I'm wrong just like anybody else does I'm not perfect you're not perfect you know when we're doing something that's not right um, you know, a wise man, if you receive a rebuke, a wise man should, will love that person that brings that rebuke because they're trying to help you. It's not because they hate you and they're trying to pick on you and be like, oh man, why are you nitpicking my life? No, look, it's, it's a matter of, I know, you know, there's this, there's this problem that I can see and, and the Bible says, that, you know, we should be doing this and, and, and this is something that will help you. This isn't designed to hurt you. But sometimes we need to get that rebuke. The Bible says give instruction. Instruction is, you know, things that way we ought to do. You, know, you think about instructions. When I put my kids' toys together, it comes with an instruction book. Okay, you do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. It's telling you what to do. So he says give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. A wise person is going to be able to receive that instruction and say, okay, yeah, you know what? You're right. This is what God's Word says. I'm going to do that. Teach a just man, he will increase learning. And it says, um, for by me, thy days shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. So you're going you're gonna to extend your life by having this wisdom, by being able to receive correction. Um, it's going to add days unto you and years unto your life. Now, um, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 12, just a few more um, chapters over. Proverbs 12 verse 1, excuse me. Proverbs 12 1 says, whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. So again, that word brute or brutish is like you're stupid, right? You're not, you're not very intelligent. It says he that hateth reproof. You, you hate being told that you're wrong. It's saying you're brutish. But, it, but if you love instruction, you love knowledge. You love learning. Uh, chapter 13, verse number 18. Proverbs 13, 18 says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Again, this is it's drawing this, these differences between someone who hates receiving instruction and someone who loves receiving instruction. You hate receiving instruction, it's going to bring you into poverty and it's going to bring you into shame. You're going you're gonna to be brought in because your sins will be increased. You don't, no one can tell you that you're wrong. You're going to be brought into poverty and shame, but if you regard reproof, if you, if you take it and receive it, then you'll be honored. And that's what we read earlier, you know, before honor is humility. In order to receive reproof, you need to be humble. That's why he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. You need to be able to humble yourself in order to receive correction so that you will be honored and God can lift you up um, by receiving his instruction. Now, we, like I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of preaching against sin here because we're trying to help. We're trying to show you your sins. In, in Isaiah 51, 58, verse 1, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. This is for the prophet Isaiah, right? His, his command from God was to cry aloud, spare not. So the preaching... Is, is done with, with loud voices. You know, that's why I cry out. That's why we get animated. Because people need to understand. He says, show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. We need to understand that, that, that God hates this, our sins. And we need to straighten up our act and, and get that together. We need to correct ourselves and get right before God. Now, when we, because of this type of preaching, it might cause you to feel guilty. Which And it should. It would be a righteous feeling if you're doing something wrong and you see in the Bible and you hear it preached against to get that feeling of guilt. And that's normal and, and, you, and you ought to. But you ought to have the right response. Now, um, maybe you hear this type of preaching, you know it's wrong, but then you go out and you do the same thing again. Okay, we're human and we're sinners. I know that happens. I'm not justifying in any way. But one of the worst things you can do then is to get out of church as a result of that. We need to be able to, yes, be able to accept that instruction, but if you fail, if you fall again, don't let that, don't let that feeling of guilt just overwhelm you 
to the point to where you think, well, I can't even come to church now because I screwed up. And, and you might feel ashamed. You might feel regret. You might feel this guilt. Don't feel like you can't come back into church because what you're going to end up doing, and this happens to people, and, and it really is a shame, but what happens then is that you know, you're not going to be helping yourself anymore. You're adding sin upon sin. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be in church even more. If you're struggling with something, hey, you need to be in church even more. If your heart's right, if you're not just completely rejecting it, look, I understand trying to get sin out of your life and falling short. And, but you got to pick yourself back up and keep going. The church is designed to help you, to edify you, and to strengthen you. If you're not coming here and getting that strength and getting edified by other people in church, if you decide, well, hey man, I screwed up, I can't even go back, I can't even show my face in church now, I can't even go back to church, you're not going to receive the strengthening that you need. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to discourage you and he wants to get you out of church so that you don't come back. And he'll tempt you and try to get you into sin so that you feel like all of a sudden, no, I can't come back now. Don't let that happen to you. I don't care, you know, you get into some kind of sin or whatever, you hear the preaching and be like, man, I feel so bad, this is wrong. You know, you might even feel like the pastor's just singling you out. Look, I usually don't know what's going on in people's lives. So if something gets preached and, it's, and it applies to you, that's God, that's not me. I'm not just like trying to pick on you. But in anyways, if I'm preaching from God's word, hey, it's his word. It's not, it's not me trying to pick on you. If anything, I'm just trying to help you, which is why I'm preaching the Bible and, and preaching out of God's Word. But don't let, this, don't let this, this type of a preaching get you out of church because you just feel guilty. Now, we ought to feel guilty. And in um, 2 Corinthians, turn there real quick. Keep your finger in Proverbs. We're going to jump back to Proverbs 12. But um, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. I want you to see this because... Being in church is where you need to be, even if it means that you're being told you're wrong. Now, in, um, in the church of Corinth, there was a problem in the church where there was actually a man that was committing an abominable act. He was committing fornication with his, with his father's wife. And you know, it doesn't, it's not clear if, you know, if they were still married or divorced or whatever. It doesn't matter. It was an abomination. He shouldn't have been doing it. And it was a problem that existed in the church because nobody wanted to reprove this person and tell them that what he's doing is wicked and wrong. Nobody wanted to approach him and he just would come openly you know, before everybody and, and this is what was going on and it was known. And it was known so much that Paul knew about it. Right? Paul wasn't even at Corinth, but he found out about it. Because it's, this is just something going on and nobody wanted to reprove or rebuke that person and tell them, hey, you're wrong. So Paul lets them know they need to do this, right? And then, and then what happens as a result? As a result of that reproof and, reproof and that rebuke, hey, the guy ends up getting right with God. That's what he needed to hear. Now, it's not always pleasant to rebuke someone or to reprove someone or to hear that what you're doing is wrong. It may not be the, the, the most pleasant experience, but... That's what we need to hear sometimes, oftentimes, to get right with God. You need to be told, hey, look, this is wrong. And often, there's a lot of things in my life that I was doing. If I didn't hear from the Bible, if I didn't hear from God's Word, hey, this is wrong and you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be you know, listening to this music or watching this or putting this in front of your eyes or whatever it may, whatever it may be, without actually hearing that, sometimes you, you just don't get it. It's like, oh man, no, this is right. i, I got to stop doing this. And um, in this case here, you're in 2 Corinthians 7. Look at verse number 8. He says, this is Paul speaking. He says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So he's saying, ye need to have this godly sorrow. It's a good thing to have a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow is one where you hear, again, you hear God's word, you see something you're doing that's wrong, and Yes, it makes you sorry. It grieves you because you've, you've done wrong to God. But use that godly sorrow 
to repentance, to bring you to repentance, to change, to do something different, say, you know what, I'm not going to continue in this course of action. I'm grieved. I did wrong. You know, I understand that it's wrong. Now I'm going to change and do different and do what's right. And this is the attitude we need to have. So if you hear something that's preaching, maybe it just, man, it just hits right home and it cuts you right to the heart. Don't feel like, man, I'm just not going back to church because I, you know, I can't take this. I just feel too bad about myself. I just feel so bad. I shouldn't be going to church and feeling bad. I should be feeling good. No. You do need to be feeling bad if it's something where you're in error and you need to correct. Use that sorrow to, to, to change. To repent, to change what your course of action so that you get right with God. Why do you want to continue living your life in defiance to God and, and out of His will and sinning against God? That's only going to bring more pain and more sorrow. Hey, it, you may think it pains you the moment you hear, hey, this is what you're doing is wrong. It's going to pain you way more to continue doing and continue sinning against God than that one instant, oh man, that kind of hurt. That's, trying, that, that's a, a friend trying to help you in love, trying to show you, hey, look, you need to get this right because it's what God said. And again, if I'm saying something that's just my opinion, or if I'm teaching false, get mad at me. You know, fine. What, you know, reject it. Don't receive it. But if it's coming straight from the Bible, if it's coming straight from God's Word, if I'm really doing my job the way I ought to be and being just the messenger of the Lord and just expounding on His Word the way that, I, that I'm supposed to do, but it's the truth and it's coming from His Word, then you need to receive it. You need to make the changes necessary. You need to have that godly sorrow and let it work the repentance in your life and just get right with God, but don't let that get you out of church. We need to learn how to receive our correction. Flip back to Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 12. Now, the worst response that you can have when someone corrects you is to get angry, to get angry mad, to get that upset because someone is trying to, correct, trying to help you by correcting you. When we get angry, we often make a lot of mistakes because then our emotions start to, to take over our rationality. We need to, to be able to keep our temperance and keep our cool, especially when someone tells you that you're wrong, to be able to properly analyze it against God's Word and against the Scripture. And if what they're saying is true, if what they're saying is right, even if it hurts, even if it cuts you, don't get angry at that. You know, a wise man's going to love that. And, and another common instinct that people have when they're corrected, besides getting angry, is they'll often get angry, but then they'll also then try to justify themselves. Well, what I'm doing isn't a sin because thus and so. You know, um, like, like King Saul. If you remember when Samuel, he was supposed to wait for Samuel because Samuel was the priest. Samuel was the one that was supposed to be offering up the sacrifices, not Saul. King Saul was of the house of Benjamin. He, it was not his duty. It was not his role whatsoever to offer up sacrifices unto the Lord. That was the priest's job. He was waiting for Samuel to, to arrive to offer up the sacrifice before he went out and fought a battle. Samuel was a little bit late. So Saul decides to just take matters into his own hands and to offer up his sacrifice. And of course, like right as he's finishing up his sacrifice, Samuel shows up. He's like, he's like, he would have waited just a little bit longer. Samuel would have been there. But the reason why I bring up this story is because Saul tried justifying himself. He said, well, I, I was forced to do this. I, you weren't here, so I had to do this. And what he did was a sin against God. It was not right for him to offer up that sacrifice. That was Samuel's job. It was not his job. It was a sin for him to do it, but he had to justify himself saying, oh, well, I had to do this sacrifice because we needed to make a sacrifice unto God before we could go out and do this. And, you know, the men were getting scared and they were ready to leave. And I have all these reasons and all these excuses why I did this sin. And instead of just saying, you know what? I did wrong. You're right. I'm sorry, God. God, forgive me. Instead of having that type of an attitude, it was this justification. Well, you don't understand. I, I needed to do this. I needed to... Don't be one that makes excuses for your sins. Be able to receive that correction. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, are you there? Look at verse number 15. Verse number 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So a fool is going to say, hey, what I'm doing is right. In my eyes, it's right. 
We don't need to, to judge ourselves in our own eyes. Judge yourself in God's eyes. In your own eyes, see what Saul was saying, in his eyes, what he did was right. Because in his eyes, there's these people, there's this problem. Hey, we have to do this, we have to do that. But what about in God's eyes? When someone comes to you with correction, think about that. How is God viewing you? How is God viewing the situation? God doesn't just, just make exceptions. He said, oh, oh, okay, Saul, even though I said explicitly that it's not for you to do this, you know, it's for the, this is the priest's job, that, that are holy unto the Lord, that are separated from the rest of the children of Israel, that, that um, the tribe of Levi was, was taken to do the service of the Lord, and it was their job, and no one else's job. Oh, it's okay, Saul, because of this situation, now it's fine. No, that's not the way God works. God doesn't give us those exceptions. He says, this is the way it is. This is my law. This is what you need to follow. Flip over to verse, or chapter number 15. Proverbs 15, verse number 5 says, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Jump down to verse number 10. The Bible says, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Again, strong warnings against, against not listening to correction, not listening to reproof. Correction being grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Um, verse number 11, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more when the hearts of, how much more than the hearts of the children of men? A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. We ought to love people who, who correct us and reprove us and, and, and are trying to help us from God's word. He's saying a scorner, you know, someone is... Um, he says he's not going to go unto the wise, and he doesn't love the person that reproves him. Uh, jump down to verse number 31 of Proverbs 15. The Bible says, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. He's saying if you, if you refuse instruction, it's like you hate your own soul. You hate yourself. And people don't like to think of it that way, but it's the truth. Because God's word, you know, if you're receiving correction from God's word, it's there to help you. you, you you're essentially what he's saying is you're hating yourself if you're ref refusing what's good for you. Um, a good example might be, you know, with, with children. My children may want to eat chocolate and ice cream for every single meal and candy and sweets. I would correct them and say, no, you need to be nourished. Your body needs to be healthy. You need to eat vegetables. You need to eat this meat. You need to, you know, you need to eat this good food that God created for you, not this junk food. And they, they could be like, well, no, I, you know, but that doesn't taste good. I want this. This is what I want. And if they're not willing to receive that correction, Right? It's like they hate their own soul. They, hate, they would be hating their own body because they, don't, they may not understand it or realize it, but the whole point of the correction is, is to, to save them and to help them and to, to make sure they're, they're healthy, that they don't have further problems down the line, further health problems. You know, then they'll start getting diabetes and they'll start getting all these other things because all they do is eat sweets and eat junk and they start getting all other diseases and problems, their organs are failing, you know, all these extra problems that come later, which would come if they just refuse instruction. Now, obviously, it's not the perfect example, but you can see where I'm going with this. It's the same application when we hear God's word. When you decide to just say, you know what, I'm not going to receive that correction. Well, the correction is going to help you in the long run. The correction is something that you need to hear now. You need to get right to prevent future problems to prevent you from, from getting into this destruction. And that's why you know, the Bible says over and over again that you, know, you, you will be destroyed, that, that your life will be cut short, essentially, when you re refuse to receive instruction. The Bible said, turn if you would to Proverbs 22. I'm going to read Proverbs 6.23 for you. Proverbs 22. Um, Proverbs 6.23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Being reproved, being told you're wrong, being corrected from the Bible, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. That is how we're going to keep walking in 
goodness and in life. Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit to correcting a child because there is an application that we can make with this, but um, receiving correction and administering a correction in this sense um, is very important. We've already seen why correction is important. We see how important it is to us that we need to be told when we're, when we're doing right, we need to be told we're doing wrong. Hey, well, we need to make sure that we're teaching and correcting our children the right way. Since receiving instruction is so important, since, since instructing people and, and, you know, and, and rebuking, reproving, these are all things that are important um, from God's Word. Well, it's extremely important for children because they don't know very much. They need to be corrected oftentimes a lot more than adults do. They need to be corrected daily. Okay, and because they're children, because they don't know, they need to learn and to grow more. And we're going to see what the Bible says about this instruction. Proverbs 22, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. We know this. We know that they're going to do foolish things. They don't understand. They don't have the knowledge. They're ignorant. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The rod. Not, not just the, the, the speaking. The Bible says the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Children need to have a correction that involves physical pain as far as like a spanking goes. And we're not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about punching your kid in the face and giving them black eye. That's what nobody's talking about that at all. But we're talking about biblical correction. And we're going to see this a lot more clearly than this verse says. This is just the first one we're going to. Flip over to Proverbs 23. Because that says, The rod of correction shall drive it far from him. We're trying to drive foolishness out of the heart of children. They need to understand, hey, this is wrong. This is foolishness. And that's why they receive the rod of correction. Proverbs 23. Look at verse number 12 of Proverbs 23. The Bible says, Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. And what, what is that correction? Well, we're going to get that in the, in the rest of this verse. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Those are some pretty serious words. And I, I'm sick of the society that we live in today that tries to say, oh, spanking is child abuse. And you shouldn't be hitting your kids and trying to, you know, look, it's nonsense. The Bible says, thou shalt beat him with the rod. Tell me what part of that verse do you not understand? This is the way we need to be correcting our children. Now, is it just in all cases, no, let's just every single time, without fail, we're always beating them with a rod? No, but this needs to be a part of the discipline. This needs to be a correction. It says, withhold not correction from the child. And one of the things that parents do today is they withhold that correction from the child. And instead of doing, you know, getting up and, and getting the rod and spanking their behind, what parents do instead, because they want to be lazy about it, or because they don't want to do it, they don't want their kid crying that much, they just yell at them, right? They'll just, say, they'll just yell at them, or call them names, or, or just do all this other stuff. Now, that's not very loving, just to be yelling at your children. Just to be, to be yelling at them, and, 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 and saying things I think could be a lot more hurtful than just giving them the proper discipline, right? If you're too lazy to get up and do what's right, then shame on you as a parent, you know, raising, no one ever said raising children is easy. Sometimes you have to stop what you're doing because your child needs to be corrected. Sometimes it's more than just, just yelling at them. You need to just, just say, this is important. My child needs to be corrected. We're going to deal with this right now. And the Bible says the way to do that is to beat them with the rod. And look what it says. It says, thou shalt deliver a soul from hell. This is the importance on that correction. Hey, children need to learn from a young age that there is a negative consequence associated with the things they do that are wrong. When they break mom and dad's laws, there is, there is a painful result and a painful consequence to their actions. It's not just sitting in a, in a corner somewhere. They're going to feel something on their rear when they decide to be rebellious and break mom and dad's rules and break those laws. This trains them to understand from a young age how God the Father is. When, when we understand that He is someone that will bring physical pain upon us, 
when we break His commandments. When it says they deliver their soul from hell, a lot of kids don't, don't even believe in hell these days. They don't even believe the place is real because all they hear about is, oh, the love of God, the love of God. Oh, a well, loving God would never send anyone to hell. Yeah, God is love. God does love us. God loved us so much, He gave us a free gift to avoid hell. But I'll tell you what, God has wrath and God has anger as well. And God is not pleased with the wicked. God is angry and furious with the wicked. He has a lot of wrath. Hell is kindled by God's wrath. And it's a real place. And there are real consequences for our sins. And it's this place called hell. And the only way we can avoid this is by receiving that free gift and, and that mercy. But here's the thing. Children need to understand this concept. It's a very, very, you know, um, I want to call it base. It's a real, real low level type of understanding here of I do wrong, there is this consequence, and it's not a fun consequence. It's not just something that, oh, I'm just going to get yelled at, and I can just tune that out, and it's not a big deal. No, you're going to feel it. You're going to experience it. And the Bible says that if you don't, you know, that, that beating them with the rod is going to deliver their souls from hell. They'll understand that concept. They're going to understand, hey, when I, do, when I break the rules, there is, a, there is a grievous consequence for my actions. Look at verse, or chapter number 29, Proverbs 29. We're talking about correcting our children now. And children, if the children are smart, they're going to receive this correction and not need to be corrected over and over and over again. And if we're smart, we're going to receive God's correction from us and not have to receive it over and over and over again. Let's try to receive it the first time. Proverbs 29, jump down to verse number 15. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. So you correct your children, you correct your son, they're going to turn out right. They're going to be pleasing in your sight because you're correcting them, because you're showing them right from wrong. Verse number 18, Where there is no vision, the people perish but he that keepeth the law happy is he. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. He that delicately bringeth up a ser his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. There's a reason why I read as far as we did in this chapter, but first I want to point out in verse 15, it says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. So parents, it's not just enough to spank your children. That's not it. So we, we saw earlier that, look, you need that rod of correction. We need to use that. But that's not enough. It says the rod and reproof. You need to tell your kids why, what they're doing wrong and why they're doing what's wrong and how to do what's right. You, you need both. You need the, the, the force of the discipline as well as the teaching and the instructing and the giving them of that extra knowledge. Giving them that reproof. Saying, hey, no, you did this. That was wrong. And make sure they're clear. This is why you're receiving this punishment. It's not good enough just to give them the punishment. You need to give them the rod and reproof. And my last point with this, and the reason why we read so far up to the point where it says, an angry man stirreth up strife and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. Because the Bible says that we're not supposed to, to provoke our children unto wrath. So we need to discipline them, yes. But we don't need to, to provoke them unto wrath. And um, when you get angry, when you mete out your discipline, that is not right. When your child is in need of discipline, you should not let yourself get angry and then go and start beating their butts. That is going to be wicked, and, and that's going to, you know, you could lose control that way, and you can actually injure your child, and, and, and that is not right. You need to keep your cool. You need to understand the reason why you're giving them instruction is because they need it and because you love them. Don't let yourself get angry. It says, an angry man stirreth up strife. The Bible says in Jeremiah 10, 24, you don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 10, 24 says, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. When we correct our children, it shouldn't be in anger. Now, they may do things to get you angry. If you get angry, 
Just wait a second, get your cool, and then go discipline your child. Because you want to do it the right way and appropriately, and the whole point is to teach them and to give them the reproof and to give them the rod, yes, but to give them that reproof. Don't do it out of anger. Do it out of love, but do it because they need it. Don't hold back. Don't slack. You'll give them the appropriate punishment, but don't let yourself get angry. Don't, don't get to that point where that's taking over what you're doing. Okay, again, we need to keep a level head at all times. We need to be temperate. And um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to try to wrap things up here. I spent a little bit of time on correcting children, but um, it's important, especially these days. There's so much brainwashing going on with, with people just trying to get away from spanking altogether when it's, it couldn't be clearer from the Bible that children need the rod of, of correction. And you know, people try to say, oh, well, the rod is trying to, to steer them this way and that. No. <laughs> That is not, if you're going to say that, then just get out of here because that, you are just resting scripture and just twisting it to mean whatever it is that your heart wants it to mean, not what it's actually saying. Because when it says, thou shalt beat him with the rod, I'm sorry, that's not talking about leading him around. That's talking about beating him. The word beat there means beat. That's what it means. It's not, it's not a euphemism. For something. It's, not, it's not trying to, it's not a, you know, a picture of something else. It's being very explicit and being very clear what we need to do in the way we need to discipline our children. But the other reason I spend so much time on that is because all of that can be applied to us as being children of God. And I alluded to that earlier, you know, as children, you know, with my children, hopefully when they do something wrong and they get corrected for it and they receive a spanking, they won't do it again. Hopefully that'll stick in their mind and be like, you know what, last time I did this, it didn't turn out so well. So I'm not going to do it again. Now, if they do it again, guess what's going to happen? They're going to get disciplined again. Hopefully, they can, they can learn quick because it'll be better for them to get that instruction right away and just, hey, then they don't have to deal with that anymore. And, and I think, God, you know, I've got really good kids. They listen well. They don't need that type of discipline very often anymore. But, they, you know, they do well. Obviously, from time to time, they screw up their kids. They need to be corrected, and I'm going to keep doing it. But they learn pretty well. They've received instruction pretty well. And as, as God's children, we need to be open to that rebuke. Hey, it might sting. You might be told you're doing something wrong, and that's going to sting. You might get corrected, and, and obviously it's not physical, but it might, it might, it might sting you. It might, you, know, you might feel it. Get it right. So you don't have to get corrected again and again and again because, look, if, God wants to, if God's going to correct you about something, He'll make sure that you're getting corrected. The Bible says in um, Proverbs 3, flip back to, to chapter number 3. We're almost done here. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 11 uh, the Bible says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. The correction that you're receiving is because God loves you, because I love you, because other people love you. When you receive correction, when you receive rebuke, hey look, it's because God loves you. I discipline my children because I love them. It's not because I hate them, because I want them to turn out right. I want them to do what's right. And this is the way that the Bible says to do it. So this is the way I'm going to do it because I love them. I'm not going to listen to the wisdom of the world because it might, you know, it might spare for their crying. The Bible says spare not for their crying. They shall not die. And I didn't include that verse in here. I should have. But it says, the Bible says, you know, spare not for their crying. They shall not die. You know, it, it's going to help them. Don't let their, you know, those tears distract you from, from giving them the appropriate punishment. Hey, we might, get, we might be brought to tears with something that we've done that's wrong when we, when we need to be corrected. But use that sorrow to be a godly sorrow to bring you to repentance. And um, you know, God brings that upon you not because He hates you, because He loves you. And He wants you to do what's right. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. We're going to continue on with um, explaining how uh, we're God's children and how this applies to us. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 5. Hebrews 12, 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. 
My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Again, same, the same exact thing that we just saw in Proverbs 3. It says in verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Chastening is a disciplining. If God loves you, he's going to chasten you and scourge you. Now, you know what scourging, that word means whip. That's an older word that scourgeth, it means whipping. He says he scourgeth every son whom he was every son. God's going to correct you. You're going to get a whooping from God if you're his son because he loves you. If you're God's son, he loves you. And we all children need a whooping from time to time to be instructed, to be reproved, to be told that they're wrong and to get right. And the Bible says he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse number seven, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And you say, what, what type of son is that? If a, you know, a father has a son and they don't discipline him, they don't chasten him, they don't use the rod of correction, what kind of a, what kind of a son or what kind of a father is that that isn't going to do that? Verse 8 says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. He's saying if you're not being disciplined by God, you might want to check yourself and make sure that you're not just a bastard and not a, and not a son of God. We all should be getting chastised from God from time to time because we're his sons. Verse number 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Again, another reason why you give discipline on the children, because they give you reverence. When you, when you spank the child for them doing wrong and you instruct them that way, you correct them that way, hey, they're going to respect you. They're going to have reverence. That's why you see the kids today that don't get spanked, that don't get this proper discipline. You see them out in Walmart and they throw these fits on the ground and they don't respect their parents at all. And you see the mom going, one, two, three, and no punishment ever comes. So they just continue to throw their fit and knock stuff off the shelves and just be completely rebellious. Why? Because they have no respect because they're not being disciplined appropriately. My children have no problem giving respect to their parents. None at all. When they start acting up, it doesn't take very much to get them right back in line. I don't, and oftentimes I don't even have to do anything because they understand, hey, if I don't listen and shape up right now, there is going to be a consequence for this. And that gets their respect. That gets their reverence real quick. And this is what the Bible says. This isn't just my opinion. Okay, this is what the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse number 9. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. He's saying when God corrects us, it's for our profit, it's for our good. Why? That we may be partakers of his holiness. Now that word holiness, that means to be separate. It means to be set apart. His holiness, God's perfection, God's pureness, God's holiness. He wants us to be partakers of his holiness. So he corrects us. We need to get right. We need to get the sin out of our lives in order to be partakers of His holiness. And He corrects us in order to do that. Verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. It's not a pleasant thing. You know, to ask my children when they're getting this bacon. It's not joyous at the present, at the time when you're receiving it. Same thing with us. When we receive correction from God, it may not seem to be joyous at the time. It stings. It hurts. But, grievous says, Nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. It's going to do you good in the long run. We need to receive that correction. We need to receive it appropriately and not just have the stiff neck. And this is the last point I'm going to leave us with. Um, Jeremiah 7. You can turn there if you'd like. Jeremiah chapter 7 is the last place we're going to turn. How important it is to receive correction. I know, uh, I hope you don't feel like I'm just beating a dead horse, but this is, a, this is an important point to get. This will help you out in church services and in your own Bible reading, hopefully for the rest of your life, to be able to understand that we need to be able to receive this correction. And, and you know, when you hear something, think about, think about the sermon, think about these things on, on how you react and what are you going to do about it. 
make sure that what's being said or what you're hearing, what you're seeing is right from the Bible. If it's right, do the correcting that needs to take place. Don't get mad at the preacher. Don't get mad at your friend. Don't get mad at you know, the person rebuking you. You should love that person. Don't get mad at them. And be able to receive the correction. Jeremiah 7, verse number 25 says, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Here he's talking to, to a whole group of people, you know, the, the, whole, the nation of Israel basically saying, look, they harden their neck. God's saying, look, I sent my prophets. I sent, rising up early and sending them. I keep sending my prophets. I keep on trying to show you. I keep on trying to correct you. But they harden their neck. They heard it and they decided, I don't want to hear this anymore. They, they made their neck stiff. They made their neck hard. And he says, therefore, I'm, you know, I'm going to send you to them, but they're not going to hear you. So I already know they're not. They've already hardened their necks. He says, but thou shalt still, you know, you still say to them, he says, look, this nation, you haven't obeyed the voice of the Lord your God, and you haven't received correction. As a result of not receiving that correction, he says, truth is perished, truth is died, and is cut off from their mouth. When you're not receiving the correction, you're going to lose the truth. And again, here at Word of Truth Baptist Church, we're interested in the truth. We're interested in God's truth. We're not a group of people here that want to harden our neck to God's truth. We want to know what it is. And if it stings, if it hurts, hey, if we need to correct ourselves, then let's do it because we love the truth. We love God's law. We love the scripture. We love his words. And we want to be corrected. We're willing to receive correction in our lives. The last verse, you don't have to turn there. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. He's saying if you're often reproved, if you hear reproving over and over again, you're told that you're wrong, you hear it and hear it and hear it, but you harden your neck, and you don't receive it, he says you're suddenly going to be destroyed. And he says that without remedy. There is no remedy. There's no fix for that. He says, you decide to just keep on hardening, stiff your neck, stiff neck, stiff neck. I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. God says, sudden destruction. There, there is no mercy in there. There's no, there's no extending any more grace. You, you, you have the, you've had the grace of, of the, the multiple rebukes, of the multiple opportunities to get right and to receive the correction. But if you keep on doing it and you keep hardening your neck, he just says, swift, sudden destruction. That's what's going to happen. And that's why it's so important for us no matter where we're at in our spiritual life, no matter how old we are, how young we are, always be ready to be able to accept correction, to receive rebuke, to receive the reproof when we're told we're wrong. Reproof, it's proved from the Bible. Okay, it's, it's, it's something when we see we've done wrong. We don't want to have a stiff neck. Open heart, receptive to God's word. And that will keep us and keep us from being destroyed. <laughs> In Jesus' name, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this, these words of wisdom. God, I pray that you please help us to, to have a humble spirit, a humble heart, Lord, that's, that puts our, ourselves and our knowledge below you and your knowledge, dear Lord. And if, if someone comes and they, and they um, have an understanding, they see something that maybe we didn't see or maybe that we thought wrong about before, but we can see that it's true from your word and, they, and they're able to show us and correct us where we're wrong, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to, to not bristle at that rebuke or not, not, uh, not have a poor attitude, not get angry, not justify ourselves, dear Lord. Help us to just, just humbly accept it and, and with godly sorrow, dear Lord, help us to repent and to get right with you. Regardless of who the source is that's bringing it to us, just help us to get right by you if it's coming from your word and we can see that for truth, dear Lord. I pray that you please just help us as, in our daily lives to be able to, to um, 
have this type of a spirit and, and humility, dear Lord. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.